Welcome in to part four of UNC Football Scouting Reports. I'm Tommy Ashley. That is the man, Jason Staples. We're sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com. Mm. Woo! Jason, we've gone through the back end, cornerbacks, safeties. We've gone through the linebackers, and now here we are at the edge rushers. I don't, you know, I've watched a ton of football over the course of my life. I think the edge, the quote-unquote edge guys – has become like a, a popular name for these players over the years. I just remember guys like Julius Peppers just being like defensive ends and all. Let's talk about the edge at North Carolina. Get started early, get started right out of the gate. Jacoby Cowan, Ohio State transfer, had some had some flashes last year, has some ability. Um, you evaluated him. You had a year of him for North Carolina. What do you see from Cowan? What does he bring to North Carolina at this position? Yeah, this is a guy who still to me is more potential than uh, than production. He, he's he's still growing as a as a college player. Uh, I think last year his the bulk of his reps were pretty frankly forgettable. He was he was a guy that was a big a big body out there, but didn't really do a whole lot to, to change the game or to, to uh, get penetration and that sort of thing when he got on the field. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, there's the old saying that uh, big guy on the f- big guy in football does a lot of times does more right by accident than a little guy does on purpose. <laughs> and he's a big guy. <laughs> so, you know, that's really the first thing he brings to the table is you're looking at a guy that has an excellent frame. He's, you know, six, four and a quarter. Uh, I think long arms for that, probably six, seven, six, eight wingspan, 270 pounds. And I think he's every bit of that, you know, 265, 270. And, you know, that's, that's good weight. He's pretty slim for being able to carry all that weight. And, you know, in terms of, of the, the, the kind of body type you want for that big end position. He brings a lot of that to the table. Uh, and then to add to that, you can see this in a, a few cases in games last year, and then you definitely see it again even more in this year's spring game, is when he's in a chase situation where, you know, let's say balls run to the sideline or he's coming from the back from the uh, the backside with an angle or whatever, you, you watch him and you go, Wait, who's that? Because he runs pretty well once he's actually free of traffic and all of that. He he has surprising chase speed. Uh, so the athleticism is is pretty good, especially for a guy that's as as big as he is. And you know, given the size and length and all of that, he's a guy that you could project as a possibility to slide inside as a situational pass rusher if ever needed. Um, yeah, just, you know, overall, a lot of nice traits that you'd like to build on and pretty natural with the long arm. You know, this is that technique where the edge guy tries to get one hand on the offensive tackle to control that so that he can keep his outside arm free to be able to do different things to, you know, reach and, and make sure that he's able to break free on the edge and contain. He's pretty good in terms of maintaining that leverage and being able to handle all of the uh, the best you know, stuff that, that offensive tackles can throw at him to keep him from being able to, uh, to, um, to contain the, uh, his response or to do his contain responsibilities. So some, some pluses there for him. Uh, the minuses really are that he's a linear player. He doesn't have a whole lot of lateral, like lateral agility, uh, his ability to redirect and do some of those things as a, you know, in terms of, of, Agility where you're not just moving forward, where you're not just bursting bursting forward, that hasn't been super impressive so far. And I'd like to see him play with a lower pad level. I mean, he's six almost six five. So I mean, that's often an issue for guys that are a little taller. But you know, he needs to come off the ball better. And and this is gonna be a mantra for me with virtually every player on the on the Carolina defensive line is they last year did a very poor job in terms of their get off, in terms of getting off the ball getting off the ball with good pad level and certainly getting off the ball with good pad level and power through that second step. This was a problem across the board on the Carolina defensive line. And this is something that he needs to do better uh, himself 
And, you know, he's a good example of, of where they need to, to make some of those improvements. And the other thing is he's, he's a guy that's not, he's not one of those guys where his, his hat bursts off the ball. He's pretty slow off the ball. The ball snaps. There's that little beat delay and then he's coming off the ball. So, you know, not doing a ton in terms of, of threatening the edge or scaring defense or offensive tackles to try to get deeper pass sets and all of that. So, you know, still much more potential than he is, you know, a, 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 an overall player at this point, but a guy that I think moving forward is a guy that you can start to, to rotate in and, and you project as a guy that might even be a starter next year that can, can really start to do things for you. But, but uh, yeah, I think this year you're looking at 15 to 20 snaps per game from him is, is kind of the, the target where he can help you mostly on rundowns. And, you know, he's one of those guys that you sub in, uh, say third drive of the, of the game, if they have the ball on their back half and you're trying to keep some of your, your frontline guys health, uh, healthy and fresher, you use him in those situations to try to eat up snaps and, and, and take care of that stuff. And I think that's what his role mostly is going to be this year. Let's look at a guy who North Carolina fans have been expecting big things from for uh, since day one, quite honestly. Hurt last year a little bit. Des Evans out of Lee County. Um, certainly um, appeared in shape, you know, dinged up and, and still suffering a little bit from some injuries in spring. But I don't know about you, maybe my own trained eye, it looks like the prototypical size for the position, Jason. What's Des Evans show you and what has he shown you and what does he need to show you to sort of fit into what the expectations were for him coming in? Well, I mean, I've said this before, so, you know, I'm, I'm be- beginning to be a bit of a, of a broken record on this, but if you built a defensive, a defensive end, a big end in a lab, that defensive end would look an awful lot like, like Desmond Evans. I mean, Des is, you know, for one of those first guy off the bus types, man, does he look good in pads? You look at him as a defense, you know, when he lines up on the edge and you're like, okay, that guy's first rounder right there. He just looks it just, man, is he pretty in pads? And then you start looking at the numbers and you go (sighs) played three seasons and he's got one sack. Well, okay. Well, maybe he's been getting a lot of pressure and just not getting sacks. And then you look at it and, you know, per uh, true media, I went through and I looked at the actual pressure numbers and he had a pressure rate of 6.6% in 2022. So when he was a pass rusher in 2022, he produced pressure on 6.6% of those plays. So if he's a pass rusher for 100 plays, he's getting you pressure on six or seven of them. And you're like, man, for that guy who looks like that and moves like that and has that kind of power – to have a career 7.6% pressure rate, that's just not what you envision. And, you know, this is where the clock is ticking for him to really pay off on the on the potential. But the thing is, the potential's still there, right? You look at him and you go, well, he did get dinged up last year. And then he did end the season sort of toward the middle point of the season. It looked like the light bulb was flickering. You're like, okay, maybe he's going to have a, a big finish to the season and then he gets hurt. You're like, dang, man. He's just he's right there. He's he's getting close. Is is that going to happen this year? And basically what you're looking looking at with him is a guy that he's huge wingspan. I mean, he's he's 6'6 six, six plus. Wingspan is even bigger than that. He's probably 6'9, six, 6'10 six, wingspan. Just enormous dude in terms of his length. And 270, you know, 265, 270 and you know can bend at that. So all those traits scream dominant edge. But he's the last guy off the ball with consistency. His first and second steps have just not been great. Uh he, you know, that initial burst he he has has tended to stand up out of his stance instead of bursting forward and threatening the, the that that edge. And then the other thing is he, you know, 
he's a one one move guy. He's using that length for the one arm on the edge and then tries to get that one hand on the on the on the offensive tackle and then try to win by bending that edge around the corner, but there's no dip move, there's no inside move built off of that. There's none of those things that you've seen from him that would help him basically become a multi-dimensional player as a pass rusher. This is where the hope is that Ted Monachino and the other support that they brought in to help these guys get better in exactly those areas. This is a guy that if, if those little areas can get just a little better, if he can add a supplementary pass rush move or two, if he can to that long arm, if he can add, if he can just get a tick better off the ball in terms of keeping lower driving through and threatening that, that offensive tackle with a little, little more speed off the edge, then you're looking at a guy who could be, you know, seven, eight sacks this year after none, none last year. I mean, that's the kind of player that you're looking at in terms of the potential, but you know, Am I going to bet on him getting double digit sacks this year? A la, you know, our uh, Gregory, G- yeah, Shout our, out Gregory Hall, our our G money Gregory Hall uh, from a couple of years ago. I'm not betting on it. I, I'm, you know, that you don't chase chase lost money with more money, and I'm I'm very much in wait and see mode. But he's a guy that absolutely could become a top of the ACC type edge defender next year if all those things fall into place and you know i have got him as as a ceiling guy where he still could find himself being drafted and drafted in the, you know the first half of the nfl draft because that talent is there he just has to show that he can he can get off the ball faster and do some of those little things and show that he also loves to play football i mean how much motor how much of this is is really a matter of motor and not not allowing himself to get blocked you know, how much does he love it? And that's the other thing. So, yeah, there's there's a lot there. We could talk about him for another hour because there's just so, – what you see on tape is just not always what you expect to see. And there's just so much opportunity for him moving forward that, that he's one of those guys that I think the success of this defense is going to very much depend on whether or not he and a couple other of these players can really make it make that – turn that corner this year. We're talking about UNC's edge rushers with Jason Staples. I'm Tommy Ashley. We are sponsored at Inside Carolina by JohnnyTShirt.com. I'm going mm. to go out of order again for you um, because I think the guy I want to talk about now is one of those guys that check those boxes you just talked about. Do they love football and all that kind of stuff? Cayman Rucker has never been considered um, to be the prototypical size guy, um, but always seems to be in the mix. Jason, your discussion or your evaluation of Cayman Rucker, um, you know, this is one of those guys that it, it, you don't expect to see a guy that size play like he does. Cayman Rucker, Jason. This guy's a freaking football player. I, I love this guy. I love Cayman Rucker. And, you know, I, I was at the uh, at the coaching clinic this this spring. And at one point I was sitting next to, to Mac Brown uh, when we were watching uh, – Ted Monachino's presentation on pass rush and they were putting up cutups from last year, you know, talking about, well, we need to be better in this area. You know, we did okay over here. This is an area that we're trying to clean up to really get this, uh, get this going. And here's how, you know, high school coaches, here's how you can try to coach this. And this is what we're trying to do to, to, to improve in these areas, all the sorts of things that you get at these, at these high quality clinic presentations. And, you know, if you're out there and you, uh, you are, high school coach in North Carolina and you have the chance to go and watch Monachino present on this you ought to it's it's uh, it's worthwhile but there are a number there there are a handful of reps that came up where you know you see three guys getting blocked and then Rucker getting getting in the backfield and I, at one point I just turned to Mac Brown and was like god I love 25 man that guy's so good and he just kind of nodded like yep yep he's a pretty good player I mean that's the thing is he's a guy that Unlike, like you said, unlike Des Evans, when you look at Rucker in pads, you don't say, man, they built that guy in a freaking lab to play this position. You don't see, you don't say that, but you don't say that about Aaron Donald either. 
right? You look at Aaron Donald out there on an NFL defensive line, a defensive tackle, and you're like, who's the small? Oh my goodness, he's in the backfield. (laughs) (laughs) Who's that guy? And this is a guy who he is the first off the ball on almost every snap. He's a guy that consistently gets penetration. He's a guy that is in the chest of whoever's blocking him before that guy gets his hands on him. He consistently wins with his hands and he bullies tight ends in the running game when he when when teams try to block him with tight ends. You can tell he loves to play football. The heavy hands, just the overall uh, passion that kind of reflects through the way that he that that he plays with with the with with speed and and all of this he is a relentless guy and the thing is he's only you know 61 61 and a half i think they list him at i don't know if that's aspirational but i mean i don't think he's a whole lot taller than me and i'm 61 61 and a half so i mean i think that's right on but this is a guy who has found ways to use his lack of height and he's not real long either in terms of arms. I mean, ideally, you'd like him to be another like three or four inches longer in the arms to be able to get those on guys. But he, he finds a way to take advantage of his smaller size in the way that like Elvis Dummerville and some of those guys in the past have done. Because what he'll do is he'll use like the dip move where he'll dip and rip underneath the, the offensive tackle. You know, you got a six five guy trying to block you. And you're six one, and you bend really well. Well, what do you do? You go under his hands, and you cut underneath. And he bends the edge with speed and with with that power. And all of a sudden, he's on the quarterback. And he's a guy that also for 260 pounds, you'll see him threaten with that big with that that quick first step, and then all of a sudden do a true power rush and just put a guy right back into the quarterback's lap. Uh, you, you know, you, you watch play after play against the running game. And it's like, oh, wow, they had one guy. Oh, that's a guy that got penetration again. It was 25. There he is. Over and over and over again, he finds ways to get in the backfield. Uh, he's going to put the offensive lineman on skates multiple times a game where he you just see him off the ball and just nasty. Just get up under the guy's pads and the guy's moving backwards. And... Yeah, I mean, that's that's who he is. So, you know, there are some physical limitations. You know, he's he's a tweener. He's, you know, not the ideal size. You'd like him to be another couple inches taller, you know, a good bit longer through the arms and all of that. He's too light, really, to play inside. You'd like him to be, you know, one of the reasons you'd like him to be a little taller is just to be able to carry, you know, 10 more pounds or so. But his overall power and strength and all of that on the edge – He's he's plus on all of those attributes. You'd like him to be faster. You know, he's not a guy that, you know, when you watch him, you know, quarterback scrambling to the edge and you see him chasing, there are some guys who, you know, quarterback scrambling to the edge and that edge guy is chasing him. That edge guy is going to win that battle. He's normally not winning that battle against most quarterbacks who are running, you know, four, six, four, seven type thing he, he's taking an angle to try to edge them out of bounds he's not he's not chasing those guys down so there's some limitations in terms of some of those things but I would pound the table for this guy in you know a late round context for the NFL next year in the NFL draft if I were an NFL scout because I would say look if I need a guy to be able to play two or three positions undersized but who's going to get penetration and who's going to have the ability to get get into the backfield as you know, that undersized edge guy with, with some power in the NFL. I think this guy can do it. I think he can be my sixth, you know, sixth uh, uh, defensive lineman on my team and, and carry a ton of value. I think he could be, you know, potentially with some growth and, and, and on the right, in the right system, he could be a, a starter on the edge in the NFL, uh, just have to be the right system and, and, and really build, build into that. But I I really like this guy. And I think he, the good thing about what they've done this year is last year he was at big end, which first of all, I don't think is ideal for him in terms of not being quite as big, but they were splitting him at big end with Des Evans and Javari Ritzy. Well, that's three guys that you expect to be 
you know, core players for you. And that means Rucker isn't on the field enough this year. They moved him to the rush end position and they've just said, look, go eat. He's going to be just turned loose as a pass rusher as often as not. And that's just one of the schematic differences that they're doing this year is they've said, this guy's a designated pass rusher. We're going to get this guy one-on-ones against an offensive tackle as often as we can, and we're going to let him go eat. And he's going to split that position with Amari Gaynor, and those guys are going to take the bulk of those reps, and I think that's going to end up, being, end up producing more pressure for the Carolina front on its own. Just doing that is going to end up getting them more pressure because that guy knows how to get in the backfield. Indeed, indeed, that is Cayman Rucker. Let's talk about the new guy. And this is a guy that Jason Staples, being a Florida State fella, is uh, certainly familiar with. Jason Amari Gaynor comes to North Carolina. He has played a ton of football. <laughs> I mean, I was looking at his bio because we have doing him for Players Lounge podcast. He played fo- college football in 2018, and it yep. is 2023. Jason, what does Gaynor bring to this team? He certainly looks to part. Physically, he looks the part. Uh, what he brings to the Tar Heels at this position. Well, I mean, you're looking at a guy that's coming in with over 1,500 snaps played for a peer ACC program. And a guy who is physically talented enough that as a redshirt freshman in 2019, he might have been the best defensive player on that defense at Florida State in 2019. Now, that wasn't a good defense. But you look at his stat line in 2019 as a redshirt freshman, 25 pressures, five sacks, seven tackles for loss, you know, 36 stops in the running game, gave up an NFL passer rating when targeted of 83.6, all that while playing outside linebacker. Pretty comparable to what they're going to ask him to do in Chapel Hill. And that was... 2019. (laughs) So now he's got that many more years of development past him where he got bounced around, played outside linebacker, true outside linebacker, then was bounced to inside linebacker for a couple seasons, then moved to kind of a hybrid edge role and then got hurt. So he's moved around in different defenses and he's, he's actually been a pretty good player in all of them. He, 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 the the good thing is that for what they're going to ask him to do, Splitting time on the edge with Cayman Rucker, he's built for it. Rucker is more of a power rusher. Gainer is more of a of a speed type rusher. And he brings explosiveness and burst to the to the table. Now you'll remember that uh Des Evans, I commented, had a six point six percent pressure rate from the edge last year. You know what Amari Gaynor's pressure rate was in 2021, which was the last season that he played before getting hurt. He, he got hurt early last year and didn't play much. 22.5%. <laughs> Significant. Yeah. Significant difference. Yeah. yeah. 16.1% pressure rate when he was at the inside linebacker spot in 2020. And as a redshirt freshman in 188 pass, pass rush snaps in 2019, he had a 13.3% pressure rate. So he had over double the pressure rate of Des Evans when he was a redshirt freshman playing as, a, as, an, uh, as an outside linebacker. So this is a guy who knows how to get to the quarterback. His pressure rate, by the way, last season when he was playing edge and didn't play as much was 100%. But that, 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 was, uh, that was in fewer, fewer snaps. So he didn't play enough snaps for me to, to really... Go, Regard that as a reliable sample, but you're looking at a guy who's who's found ways to get to the quarterback and affect the quarterback over and over and over again, and he does this with burst and explosion, and he's you know frankly he plays angry. He's a headhunter. He's a guy who um, you know he's a little bit undersized for the edge. You know he's not a not a full time edge in terms of you'd like him to be about two forty five to kind of play the position that he's at. And he, he's, he's about 230 right now. Like him to be a little heavier to, to really play that role. But at 230, he's a guy that is hard for, de- for offensive tackles to get their hands on. And even when they do get their hands on him, he's surprisingly powerful because he's bringing that kind of speed and explosion to the edge. So the, the, the downside for him is he's a guy that can get tunnel vision. 
So he can get so focused on getting that penetration and getting to the quarterback and that sort of thing that he is a guy that you can, you can screen, you can, you know, misdirect at times. And, you know, he's not been quite as reliable against the outside run sometimes because he'll get fixated. He gets that tunnel vision, but overall he's a guy that brings some things to the table that Carolina has badly missed. He's going to be the first guy off the ball. When you ask him to rush the passer, he's going to be a guy that's going to terrify offensive linemen into getting deeper pass sets. And if they don't get deep enough, he's just going to bend the edge and go around him. If they get too deep, he's going to cross their face and get right to the quarterback. And he's going to get pressure. Just adding him to the roster means you're adding pressure. And what they're going to do this year is they're going to be able in passing situations to slide Cayman Rucker over to rush end or over to big end and then put Gaynor on the field at rush end and have both those guys turned loose. That's what they're going to do some. And, you know, this is their solution. Like they're trying to find ways. They know last year they were among the worst te- in the country in terms of generating pressure on the quarterback. And they need to find ways to do it. They're going to do it with with Cayman Rucker on the edge as a primary guy from the rush end, end position. And then when he's not at rush end, they're going to do it by having Amari Gaynor at that position. And sometimes they'll put them both on the field. And basically that allows them to do what you know teams like Georgia have done. You look at Nolan Smith, who's a comparable build to uh, Amari Gaynor and, and similar kind of forward explosion, what Georgia did with him he actually was a full-time edge at about 240 pounds at Georgia and was dominant because of, of the, 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 the way that he was able to use that speed moving forward and, and, and getting, getting after the quarterback. Gainer's not quite that good. He's not quite as, as, as fluid, but he's a guy that, that, again, gives you a plus level pass rusher in the ACC. And that's something they didn't have on the roster really last year, especially once Noah Taylor went down. Yeah, and he's a guy who's in his last year of college eligibility. So he's going to play with an edge. He's going to play. This is a contract year for somebody like that. And Gaynor certainly brings experience, if nothing else, to North Carolina, a ton of experience. And when you're an active leader at a college football school and you play for four years, you've had some success. So everything Jason says is accurate. It'll be interesting to see how he blends in, how he makes others step up. Jason, one more guy before we get out of the edge rushers, and it's sort of a hybrid. Um, Not really sure what North Carolina wants to do with him, but Jawari Ritzy certainly played on the edge at times. Um, Level of success doing it uh, remains to be seen, and and I want to hear your take on him. And we'll talk about him a little bit in the defensive tackle side, but just Ritzy's ability to play out here – on the edge and sort of bend the edge, get some pressure from the outside. Yeah, this is another guy who, you know, is a first off the bus type player. You put him out there just to let other teams see him coming off the bus because he really looks he, he looks good in pads. He just does. And uh, has he has a, he play he can play with a lot of power. He doesn't always play with it, but he's got the power to play with. He's a former shot putter in high school, and you can see that sometimes with the way that he'll get his hands on somebody and get up under him and and all of that. Uh, But he's also a guy that has been a bit of an enigma. Uh, He, he has not been as effective as you would hope. You you know, you, you thought maybe coming into, into last year, you thought, okay, this could be the year that he takes a big step forward and becomes a real problem for ACC teams. He's got the physical traits can he can he make that can he take that step and he didn't he played basically at the same level he did as a true freshman and in some cases regressed you know as a run defender i think he was worse last year than he was as a as a true freshman he's going to have to take a big step forward but again he is a guy at 64 and change he's 64 and a half or so and he's a legit 290 and he's quick enough to play the edge at that size you know what a luxury that is? I mean, that there there is not a college football team in the country that would not take Javari Ritzy to be in their defensive line rotation. Same with Des Evans. They'd look at him and be like, well, I don't know if he can play or not, but we'll see if we can coach him up. We'll see if we can get him to play because the traits are there. Uh, and, you know, this is a guy that can play every position on the defensive line. And at the same point, 
last year, 8.5%, uh, let's see, yeah, 8.5% pressure rate. Another one of those eight out of a hundred, eight or yeah. nine out of a hundred. It's like, okay, that's okay. I mean, you look at na nationally, that's middling. It's not great, but if you're supposed to be a former five-star type guy and you have those physical traits, two tackles for loss and 644 snaps ain't getting it done. You got to, you got to have a guy that's making more of a difference. And the other thing is that there were times last year where he teams teams targeted him in the running game. There are a couple of programs. And I won't I won't specifically name name all of them, but uh, Notre Dame in particular. They 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 ran the football specifically at Javari Ritzy last year. And it happened a couple other times, but Notre Dame in particular, when he was on the field, they ran it at him because they yeah. thought they could move him, and they did. And there were times where. You know, again, he's got the hips and hands to be able to move guys, but he was one of those guys that, you know, tends to peak a little bit, you know, stands up a little bit. And then if you watch, there's too many times where, whether he's on the front side or the back side, as soon as there's a double team, he's actually moving backwards. He's not resetting the line of scrimmage forwards like you hope from a guy that's 290 pounds. He's, he's stalemating or he's getting moved backwards way too often. So, and again, that has to do with foot, his footwork was a mess in 2022. What were they working on this spring with all these guys? Right there. Yeah. This is one of those guys who physically and all these other things has the ability, if he can get some of this stuff cleaned up, to completely be a different kind of player this year. Can he clean up that footwork? Can he handle the double teams and, and make sure that he you know, matches pressure with pressure and embraces that double team and, uh, you know, gets toward the center of that double team rather than getting moved laterally? Can he avoid getting reached by making sure that his hat's off the ball just a little bit quicker? Can he get into the backfield and do that? Because he's got the ability to do that. But as an edge guy, he really is a run, run stopper. That's what he is. He's not going to have a ton of explosiveness as a pass rusher from the edge. But this is where... He also plays on the inside. And last year, some of their best pass rush situations were when he was lined up at nose tackle in odd fronts in pass rush situations because he was consistently generating pressure from the nose tackle position in, uh, in you know, long yardage situations. You go back and you watch the pit game, and he beat the pit center like a drum when he was lined up at nose tackle when it was pass rush only. And that gives you a sense of, okay, so if he knows it's time to get off the ball and he's, he's got the responsibility of just getting upfield, he actually has the capacity to do it. So he's one of those guys I'm really interested to see how, it was, how or whether he's able to progress this year because he's another guy that I see as a potential NFL guy, but based on potential, not production. The production does not scream NFL. The, the, the production so far is guy who's going pro in something other than sports the potential is a guy that's, you know, pre mid round draft pick. What's, what's he, what's he want to be? What, what, where, where does that come out next year? I think you're going to see him play both inside and out again. He, he was over, he was around 40 snaps a game last year. Um, I think he's going to be in the same, same ballpark this year. Again, splitting reps with Des Evans on at the big end, but I think your your best bet is for him to be inside in pass rush situations. And again, you start to get your best pass rushers all in the field and 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 see what happens there. But he's going to have to make sure that he doesn't get washed as often in the in the run game to really have the value that you want him to have for Carolina up front. Yeah, Jason. Real quick, we are talking about the edge rushers for North Carolina. Overall thoughts on this position? I, I think if you pull pull bits and pieces about what we've talked about now up until now in this podcast in this uh, evaluation of these players it's pretty clear that there is a there has been some sort of systematic issue with the with what these guys are learning we'll put it that way Jason <laughs> how how can uh <laughs> how can this position be better or what can this position do to um 
ensure Carolina has a successful season and a better season on defense in 2023? Well, here's the thing. It's, I think, evident to everybody that North Carolina had a systematic problem in terms of what they did up front last year. And nowhere is that more obvious than what kind of hires they made in the offseason. They brought in two, two guys to help on that, uh, in that area to essentially refine what they were doing in practice, to be extra eyes on that, on that position group, to help in the film room, to, you know, to do all of that, to help also even schematically. But everything from the drills that they do on a day-to-day basis to what they're going to do in terms of how they are arranging their fronts to make sure that they get advantageous one-on-ones for the guys that they want to get those one-on-ones, everything is being sort of uh, ha- was reevaluated and is being sort of restructured and, and done differently this year to try to fix some of that. Because I'll tell you right now, internally, this is Mac Brown all the way down. They know that there was a major systematic problem there. It was a systemic problem. So they're trying to fix it. And by the way, if you, if you look at the numbers and, and I'll, I'll have an article on inside Carolina coming later this summer on this, you look at the numbers last year, North Carolina, the pressure rate, for uh, defensively was 26.7%, which finished for 119th in the country. The sack rate last year was 3.4%, which was 130th. The only, the only team worse in the country last year in sack rate was Colorado. And they were what? One and 11. Yeah. That was a bad roster. So North Carolina was second worst in the country in sack rate with a bunch of blue chip recruits on the, on the defensive line. That means you've got a system, a a systemic problem. And that's why they went out and they made the hires that they did. That's why they reevaluated and said, okay, we need to work on this, 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 and this. And I can tell you from watching some spring practice and and some of that, the drills that they were doing were exactly (laughs) drills that I would have prescribed to say, look, they're terrible at this. (laughs) You've got to do well. And in some cases there were drills that I may not even have known about, but in looking at what they're doing, I'm going, I know what they're working on there. And I may not have prescribed that because I didn't know about it, but that's exactly what they need to be working on. Right. So that's, that's where they're at. Yes. This is to me, if Carolina is going to take a step forward defensively this year and they have to, they, they absolutely have to, because they were bad defensively last year. This is where it has to start. It has to start with, the edge and defensive tackle positions where they've recruited too well to have poor havoc and pressure levels from the defensive line. I mean, you think about it, let me put it one, one other way. And again, all this will be in, in a later article. Clemson last year faced 566 dropbacks, right? Comparable number of, of games played because both teams played in the conference championship game and a, and a bowl game. So 566 dropbacks, and they got pressure on 210 of those. Wow. Okay. North Carolina faced 540. So that's, what, 26 fewer dropbacks. And they got pressure on 144 of those. That's getting pressure on like a third less. Work to be done. So that's what they're doing. The biggest thing, like I said, is they've identified... What guys do we have that can win one-on-ones? Who do we want to get in one-on-ones? How can we line up to make sure that that guy and that guy are one-on-one when teams are going to throw the football? And then how can we arrange our defense so that those guys are turned loose one-on-one? And then how can we drill it day after day after day after day so that these guys are getting off the ball correctly with low pad level, with aggressive first and second steps and actually generating penetration by proper technique. That's what they've done. And we'll see whether or not that's, that's going to be enough. But ultimately I said this last year with this group, with the guys, with the bodies they have on the roster, if they can't get more, I said last year, if they can't get more out of the, the defensive line than they did the prior year, then there need to be some changes made after the season. Well, They didn't make the change that some people wanted, which was, you know, fire the defensive line coach or whatever. That's not always a solution. What they did is they went out and they added. Instead of getting rid of, what they did is they added. 
they said, okay, we can, we can, we can solve this by bringing in new eyes and, and dealing with some of these things that way, rather than just, you know, termination. I think fans tend to jump to termination too quickly as it were, as it is. And that's why I said last year, there need to be, there needs to be evaluation and there will need to be changes made. That does not mean termination. Now, the question is, were those changes the changes that needed to be made? And will it be enough? Because this year, if they can't do better than that and significantly better, then that's probably going to mean much bigger changes end up getting made yep. across the program. And and you, there's just too much too much there and there's too much at stake not to be better at those positions this year. I agree with that. I agree with Jason Staples always. That's him. This is me. Tommy Ashley, this has been Inside Carolina. UNC football scouting reports over at Tar Pit Premium Message Boards. Join up, get your 10% off your Johnny T-shirt order, and you just get to be a part of the Inside Carolina Premium Boards that are – it's where all the news is. So take care of that by joining that. You take care of Johnny T-shirt when you're part of that. Jason and I will be back for more. We've got defensive tackles, and then we've got the offensive side of the ball culminating in an evaluation – of a guy that Jason said might be pretty good long, long time ago. Jason, as always, my friend, thank you.